So hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. I hope that you are healthy and uh, uh, in some safe place uh, to uh, listen to this webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Dvořák and I'm a CEO of uh, Vultra, a cybersecurity company based in Prague. Uh, we basically specialize in the digital banking security. Today, we will be talking about uh, a very special topic uh, about a recently discovered uh, vulnerability, Strandhawk 2.0, that was uh, uh, discovered just and announced just a couple of days ago by our Nordic partner, a company called Promon, uh, which is uh, you know a company that specializes in a, a mobile application RASP, basically a protection of runtime. And uh, we will cover basically everything about Strandhawk today. We will tell you what it is. That's the important thing. Then uh, we will immediately switch into some history. We will cover some historical facts about uh, Promon and uh, sorry about Strandhawk. Then uh, we will uh, show you a demo, which is uh, uh, probably the best uh, part of the webinar. Uh, we will talk about the principles of uh, Strandhawk. And uh, of course, uh, we will also tell you what to do about it. That's the important part. Uh, it's just uh, something that we couldn't avoid in this uh, webinar. Um, before we start, uh, I will also cover some organizational questions. So we are streaming this uh, on YouTube. You can also watch from LinkedIn stream. So that's uh, uh, two places where this webinar is available. Uh, on YouTube, you can actually ask us questions. You can ask questions live. We will answer questions if they are uh, there uh, in the end of the webinar. So do not hesitate if uh, anything is not clear. Just uh, shoot us a quick question. And uh, finally, the recording of this webinar will be available on YouTube. So uh, after we finish, you will be able to share it with your partners, uh, colleagues, uh, vendors, basically with everybody who could be interested in the content. So uh, I think this is uh, everything from the organizational point of view. So let's get started. So Strandock 2.0 is actually quite an unpleasant uh, vulnerability uh, in, in the Android operating system. Uh, Promon, uh, the company that founded it, announced it to uh, the public uh, on May 26, so, so just a couple days ago. This uh, vulnerability was actually given its uh, own CVE number, uh, 2020 uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, actually unpleasant in uh, several ways. Uh, uh, it's uh, the second generation of uh, malware uh, type, basically, of a strand of malware type. We'll talk about it later. And what it allows is uh, first permission escalation. So the attacker could actually request some additional permissions on behalf of the of the user uh, pretending to be some other application. And the second unpleasant uh, thing that Strandhawk is able to do is uh, phishing via basically very sophisticated and convincing overlay attack. And as such, it can steal security credentials, for example, to the banking application or to any other application as we will show uh, in our demo. So why is it called Strenok 2.0? Why is it you know, the second generation? I will cover a little bit of history here just to uh, give you a little bit of a background. So uh, actually there was a Strenok 1 vulnerability that Promon announced just a couple months ago on December 2nd. And this was a vulnerability that was uh, uh, basically abusing some commonly available feature called task affinity to present its own user interface inside of uh, other application. Strandhawk didn't require any routing uh, escalation. It didn't require any permissions uh, that would be somehow suspicious. However, it had to be declared in Android manifest of the malicious application. So it was a very static attack. It's not possible to, possible to dynamically update Android manifest. And uh, as a result, it was very easy to detect. The Strandhawk vulnerability was actually seen in the wild. It was commonly used by the banker software, by families such as Anubis or Cerberus. That's uh, something that uh, was actually uh, happening in the Czech Republic quite often. And uh, the concept itself of the Strandhawk vulnerability was not entirely new. Uh, the proof of concept was actually shown at uh, the Usenix uh, conference in 2015. Uh, and uh, the first generation of Strandhawk was basically mostly uh, this uh, labeling of this vulnerability with something that can be uh, easily communicated. Unlike Strenok 1, Strenok 2 actually uses implementation error in the Android operating system. It also doesn't require any root access or permissions, but it also doesn't require any declaration. Uh, there is no visible trait of the vulnerability in the source code. 
it can be fully dynamic, uh, downloaded from some online service. And uh, it's actually quite hard to detect. Luckily, we didn't see it uh, used uh, by malware makers yet. So it's uh, not something that would be actually causing any problems. And unlike uh, Strandock 1, this is actually a newly dis discovered flaw in the Android operating system that has been there for basically ages uh, since, the, since the very beginning of Android. So if you should remember uh, one thing about the difference between Strandock and, and Strandock 2, is that, is, is that uh, while they actually do the same thing from the attack perspective, they are very different in how easily can be detected. Uh, while Strandock 1 was declared in Android manifest and uh, fairly easy to detect, Strandock 2.0 uses dynamic attack and it's basically almost undetectable. That's something that uh, causes a lot of problems to potential security research. So let me show you a demo of this uh, vulnerability. And uh, I like it very much because it's kind of like a close-up magic in, in almost a literal way. If you are performing an overlay attack or any attack on a mobile device, the user is actually holding the mobile device in his or her hand. And uh, as a result, you need to really perform the trick uh, very precisely. So every close-up uh, magic basically has three phases. You show something ordinary. This is, this is ordinary ball. Uh, this is ordinary egg, ordinary coin. Then you distract the audience, which is the important part. And then finally, you show some shocking, unexpected outcome. So let me show you some <laughs> example of a magic trick. This is a smoothie magician. One ball puts in the hand. Second ball puts in the other hand. Now distracts the audience by shaking the salt. And voila, the one ball disappeared. And the second ball suddenly appears in the hands. So that's actually, actually quite a neat trick. And, uh, we will actually show you a very similar one, probably not as not as uh, entertaining uh, because it will be on a, on a mobile device, but uh, uh, this will be the actual strand hook vulnerability. So we will start by showing you that uh, we have empty sleeves. There are no recently used apps and we will launch an ordinary Gmail app. Uh, it's not connected to any account, but it doesn't really matter in our case. We just used an empty, empty Gmail on an empty device and now we terminate the application again, and we start our demo app for Strandhawk. It's a simple app, uh, which basically asks, do you have a bad day and feel sad? Well, it's Friday, but I could always use some cheer up. So let's make our day better. Oh, it's a cute kitten. Look, look how cute it is with its little eyes and tiny little nosy. Who wouldn't want to cuddle with it? <clears throat> I mean, I wouldn't because obviously I'm kind of a macho, but uh, I think that the rest of the audience actually would so that's enough about Kitten. I hope that this was sufficiently awkward to also cause some distraction. And uh, we can move on and uh, basically show that we have still empty sleeves and launch the Gmail application again. And as you can see, uh, we actually just uh, showed our own fake user interface perfectly embedded into the Gmail app. And we could use it for phishing or any other malicious attacks. So I think that uh, uh, I will just recap first uh, what we did. We basically launched an ordinary Gmail app. Then I distracted the audience with a kitten picture. And we shocked the audience by basically uh, hacking the Gmail by, by putting some fake uh, user interface inside of the running application. So that's, uh, uh, that's uh, the basics of the trick. And so I will continue because you probably have some questions, right? The, how did it happen? So I will first disprove some trivial explanations. So uh, we were using regular Gmail app. We didn't modify the Gmail app in any way. Uh, we actually launched the legitimate Gmail app twice, first in the beginning of the video and then uh, in, in the end of the video. So it was regular Gmail, not nothing fishy about it. It doesn't only work with Gmail. It works with almost any application that is currently available. So you can target banking app, cryptocurrency system, payment application, basically anything. The device was not rooted. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't like to show you such a lazy, lazy cheap trick if we rooted our device. We didn't uh, use any special permissions that we approved earlier. And we didn't declare anything in the, in the manifest. The application is actually pretty simple. Uh, 
we could probably also avoid the long, uh, slightly disturbing kitten <laughs> in Termenzo because the long kitten exposure wasn't really necessary. It doesn't really matter for how long you were looking at the kitten. The attack actually happened just after the kitten picture showed up. And uh, we didn't use any computer graphics or video manipulation. I, I don't mean uh, necessarily rendering a Jurassic Park movie. Uh, I just mean uh, skipping some uh, a couple of uh, frames to make it look more fluent or smooth. We were using the video as it was. So what happened? To understand what happened, we need to talk a little bit about Android. Most of the users uh, view Android as uh, some simple smartphone, basically, that can launch applications. But applications actually are a little bit more complex than what the user can see uh, with basically an untrained eye. Applications are actually tasks that have uh, activities inside them. So task is basically the application that you can mostly see in the task switcher. And activities are the big use cases of the application. For example, the list of uh, email messages or composing a new email. Uh, each activity then has uh, several uh, fragments which basically represent the views in the, in the, in the user interface. And the uh, uh, programmer can commonly start uh, a new activity by launching an intent. Intent basically says which activity you would like to start. And you can call start activity with the intent instance. And as a result, a new activity is uh, created on the stack of the task it belongs to, basically. This is slightly more complicated because you can actually uh, use quite a lot of flex to uh, say how the activity should be launched and in which tasks and so on. But uh, to make it simple, let's just uh, leave it with that. There is also a little bit more awkward way to launch the activity uh, by using the start activities method, which launches a collection of activities, uh, or sorry, a collection of intents rather than activities. And uh, this is not very commonly used. There are not too many use cases for such uh, functionality, uh, but it's still available in the SDK. And as it turns out, uh, this uh, does not really manage the state uh, correctly. Uh, I must uh, appreciate the, the research that uh, Promon engineers did in this, at this point, because they actually found something that is really not so easy to find. They actually found a flaw in a way how Android operating system manages activities when they are launched in, in bulk. So Strandhog vulnerability is actually using a little trick. It launches three activities. So which activities? So the first one is the victim activity. That's basically our original Gmail. Um, it's uh, basically any application, uh, because every application has at least one activity. Uh, you need to flag this activity with this uh, new task flag uh, so that it launches in a new task. And there is some additional secret source that we are not really feeling comfortable sharing, because this is something that uh, still is not disclosed by Promon. Uh, so uh, we will currently leave it at that, and uh, we will a little bit talk about it later. Then uh, there is the fake activity, which is basically the attack activity. And uh, this activity is launched without any flags, which means that uh, you can generally uh, just launch a new activity. And finally, there is a destruction activity, which was our kitten. And uh, this uh, uh, kitten is actually also flagged with a new task uh, flag. And uh, this is just because when we launch the attack, we don't want to just show the Gmail application to the user. We would like to show some other user interface. So going back to our picture, uh, this is what actually happens in, in the Android uh, ecosystem. We create two tasks, one with the victim uh, activity and fake activity on top. And then the second activity with uh, the destruction, with basically the kitten. And, uh, uh, when the user uh, sees the, the attack, uh, actually only the last activity is shown. No other activities are visible to the user. And when the user closes the uh, user interface, there is nothing visible afterwards. So we also have a full source code available in our, in our uh, uh, possession. So if you would like to uh, uh, basically see more details, uh, you can uh, just drop us a message. We will. Uh, verify you first, and then we will be able to share the source codes or more details on how this attack is actually performed. And, uh, and for this webinar, we will just say that uh, this screenshot is actually a bl blurry screenshot of the entire attack. So there is nothing more. There is only this one screen. So it's a fairly simple attack uh, and a fully dynamic one. So 
which devices are effective? That's another question. So we saw the attack and maybe it's problematic on all devices and maybe it's problematic only on some of them. So if we look at the version of Android that are affected, Android 10 is actually not affected at all by this vulnerability, uh, which means that uh, users with uh, the newest versions of uh, Android operating systems are not really affected. Then there is uh, Android 9 and Android 8, uh, which are basically affected. Uh, they uh, demonstrate this vulnerability, but the patch was already released by Google uh, in a May uh, update of the operating system, or basically of the security update. And uh, finally, older versions of Android are currently affected. Uh, you can still do Strandhawk, and they will never be patched, probably. <laughs> or at least Google didn't announce that uh, it would patch Android 7 and uh, lower versions. So what is actually interesting is to look at the blue section on Android 9 and Android 8. And uh, before we do that, I will just uh, recap the timeline of this of this uh, attack. So basically, uh, Promon notified the Google and discovered the vulnerability on December 4th in 2019. So it was a relatively long time ago. Then in May this year, Google released a security patch. So just uh, let it sink in a little bit. It takes five or six months to uh, deliver a patch of uh, some vulnerability like Strandlock. And uh, also, if you look uh, at uh, all the Android versions in the history from Android 4 upwards, uh, the vulnerability was always there for, for years, basically. Then on May 26, Promon disclosed the issue to the public. And uh, the question is, what is the situation now? So the patch is released, security uh, bulletin is updated, uh, every, everything is disclosed, so is it uh, resolved already? And uh, luckily, we have some good data from Alvalytics, and we can see that uh, nearly 65% of devices that we can currently see are still affected by the vulnerability. 29% uh, of the devices are actually using an operating system that is not affected at all. And uh, the patch was delivered to 6.3% of uh, devices that would be otherwise vulnerable. About 44% is vulnerable but not patched. And uh, over 20% is vulnerable and will not be patched. Basically, the Android versions uh, that uh, our users are using will not receive the security update. This is actually data from two days ago, so fairly fresh. So now the important part, how do we mitigate such issue? How do we basically get rid of uh, Strandhawk uh, on our devices? So we categorized the suggestions into two categories. First of them is basically partial remedies, something that somehow helps, but it doesn't guarantee the result. One remedy is active malware detection. So if you embed some plugin for active malware detection into the mobile application, you can detect the malware because it doesn't only use Strandhawk most of the time. It also has some additional permissions for reading the SMS messages and so on and so on. So it actually could be possible to detect the malware. And even if you don't, you can protect the other users that downloaded the same malicious application once you managed to detect the first instance of such a problematic app. The second uh, partial remedy is behavioral biometrics. This is something that uh, can help because uh, when the attacker actually steals the credentials, uh, you still can uh, prevent the attack when the attacker is trying to use them manually in some system, right? Um, however, we are in the position where the primary credentials already leaked, which is not uh, the best situation to be in. And finally, there is uh, obviously transaction monitoring. So if you know that some account is suspicious or that some transaction is suspicious based on the parameters of the payment, of course, uh, you can stop it. That's uh, something that would work in any situation. We also have some working issue fixes, basically something that uh, mitigates uh, the issue completely. So one of them uh, is something that you can do yourself, which is changing the application implementation to use uh, and two special flags, single task or single instance on all public activities. Uh, this is uh, basically preventing the strand attack by uh, disallowing the, the stack uh, issue that we saw earlier. On the other hand, it has some undesired consequences. For example, it can change the flow of your application. You would always start in the launcher activity when the user taps the icon instead of uh, uh, on the place where the user actually left the, the uh, application last time. So this is one option. Uh, then uh, there is uh, probably a better approach uh, by active task monitoring. This is actually something that uh, upshielding does uh, and uh, 
promote actually promote this feature uh, in their communication uh, uh, by monitoring the tasks that application process receives so you can actually stop the offending tasks tasks that do not belong to your process which is probably the right way to uh, mitigate the issue and of course you can always ask your users to un update the android operating system and uh, disallow uh, the older versions of operating system in your application but it's always complicated as you saw uh, earlier it takes some time before some vendors push uh, the patch of android we have some vendors uh, who are in a problematic situation. Uh, I think that we all noticed the subject of uh, Huawei, who probably isn't really proactive in delivering security patches at this point. Uh, and uh, ultimately, many users are still using Android uh, below 8.0 uh, version. So that's also a little bit uh, problematic. So this was uh, basically the summary of, uh, of the, of the uh, Strandog vulnerability. And I will just check if somebody asked uh, any questions uh, in the um, in the comment section on uh, YouTube. Uh, I don't uh, see any, so I think that uh, the introduction and the information was clear. So let me just uh, jump back quickly on on, on the video and uh, uh, basically uh, end this uh, webinar. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for attending. If you have any questions or if you have any uh, additional information that we could uh, help you with. Uh, please contact us at uh, hello at uh, vultra.com and uh, obviously uh, we would be happy if you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you subscribe to, uh, to the LinkedIn uh, account that we have and uh, of course uh, please share this video to your colleagues and uh, to your vendors and to everybody who could be concerned about it. Thank you very much.